Adam Curtis, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Glad to have you on. Um, the union is on the verge of collapse. The economy is on the verge of collapse. And elites manipulating crises to enrich themselves off the state. That sounds like a description of post-COVID Britain, but it equally applies to late 20th century Russia, the subject of your latest series of films, Trauma Zone, which is out on iPlayer now. Would you tell us about it? Well, I mean, what you described does sound remarkably similar. But on the other hand, though, if you look back to that time, it, what Russia was like, what, 30 years ago, or what was called the Soviet Union then, was completely different from us. But, it, but its collapse was, in a way, the door that opened to the chaos that we now have everywhere. But it was different. And one of the reasons I made these films is because I don't think that we in the West fully understand or even really comprehend what millions of Russians went through at that point 30 years ago. Because what, they, what happened to them was that their whole world just collapsed around them. Um, and it was an empire. I mean, the Soviet empire is, was, an extent, was a growth out of the Russian empire, which had been going for a number of years. And what they experienced was the collapse of an empire. The British empire collapsed what? 80 years it took? They collapsed in just a few months, in 1991. It literally was like that. And then they were promised a new world, which was going to be a kind of democratic capitalism, which would be in, it brought about very quickly. Within, what, eight years, that had collapsed into total corruption. Uh, their whole institutions had fallen apart. People were living in forests, underground. No one could buy any food. Well, most people couldn't buy any food. And the system was being looted by a small number of very rich people. I don't think we understood what that did to millions of people. And I just wanted to show what that, what it was like. Not just, I mean, I wanted to tell the story, but I also wanted to show what it was like. And I was lucky enough to have, because I work in the BBC, the, the raw material which was, had been sitting for years in the Moscow offices of the BBC, thousands of hours of raw, unedited footage recorded all across that country over the past 35 years, which just recorded what it was like. So I just decided I want to show people what this is like. I started it before the invasion of Ukraine. Um, really as a public service, I just thought, listen, the people paid for this material. They should see it. We should put it up on, on iPlayer. Then the invasion happened and it became clear to me that really what I should be trying to do is as well as just doing that, I should be trying to say, look, this is the strange collapse of belief in everything that gave you Vladimir Putin. That it's not some evil conspiracy by the KGB to take control again or anything like that. He was born out of the implosion of an empire and then the implosion of a democratic system. and you need to learn from that. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a little bit dogmatic, but you, I just think we need to know what they went through in order to understand why Putin happened. He's not just some evil force that came out of another galaxy. He, he came out of that, and I was just trying to describe that to people. We'll, we'll come to that and the geopolitical consequences of that implosion. Uh, just a word on your creative process, I guess. How on earth do you go about imposing order on thousands of hours of unedited, unedited raw footage from so late Soviet uh, to, be, to be honest, it's like shopping. It, I don't know if you... No, the, the, the key rule in shopping, as far as I know, is you go to shop... If you spot something you really like, you, just want to, you must buy it. If you have any questions about it, don't buy it, because you will regret it. And... In our digital age, what I got was this footage, which had been recorded on tape, was then digitized and turned into uh, video uh, files. You can go through them very quickly. And I, I'm afraid, this is, I mean, this sounds ruthless, but I adopted the shopping approach, which is that if an image grabs me immediately, I think, oh, that's good. And because I think I'm quite normal, I think, well, actually, most people would be interested in that. If I have any questions about it, unless it's completely functional, I need it. I will go, no. So I just, initially, I just go through it. I mean, it takes hours, but I do that. It's just, does that grab you? If it grabs me, then it'll probably grab other people. You've written uh, about Trauma Zone that for a long time, everyone in that society knew that nothing really worked anymore. There was nothing they could do about it. Were there any in late Soviet Russia who still believed but couldn't see what was self-evident to others? I think the answer, 
I mean, you never, I mean, you can, you mustn't oversimplify society. And I'm sure there were people within the communist system and amongst the elite, which were called the nomenclatura, who did believe in it. But the overwhelming thing you get from talking to Russians from that time, and I was filming there, I mean, I made a film there in, in the early 90s, uh, but also from reading books of, of, of people from that time, the overwhelming thing is that no one really believed in that system any longer. And they knew that the people in charge didn't really believe in it any longer. But that what, they, what people also knew is that those in charge had no other idea of any alternative. So everyone just accepted it as a system that no one believed in, but because there wasn't anything else, you just went along with it. So when it collapsed, it came as a terrible shock because it wasn't like traditional political revolutions where you have, you're pushed, I mean, like say the Russian Revolution, you're pushed along by an alternative idea. There wasn't one. There really wasn't one. And that is the parallel with today here. We have a very different society from Russia 30 years ago. But I would argue that what most the defining characteristic of our present society in Britain is that everyone knows that somehow this system isn't working. But no one, whether they be in the opposition or in the government or amongst the journalists or amongst many millions of people, have any idea of what other system would work. So we just sort of accept it, lurching. You know, it comes like waves in a sort of fever. We lurch from one position to another, all trying to rework that system. But underneath, we know that they know that, it, that we know it isn't working. And it, it's like, and it becomes this horrible feedback loop of not knowing it isn't working, but not having any alternative. And they know we know they don't know any future. <laughs> well, we do. I mean, if you look at the Labour Party at the present moment, they're going to probably win the next election. But they will do it because they're not the present lot. It's not because they're offering us an, in, a, an extraordinary, inspiring alternative. They're not. It doesn't need to be that inspiring. They don't really have any other system. And I think that is similar. We are at the end of something. Um, and, and maybe Russia was just part of something much, much, much bigger. I mean, we could generalise from that, but I won't lead you on to Iran. No, why not? Um, there's, do you think there is an acknowledgement then about how this current system doesn't work do you think do you think they're in the same way that it you know in in um late soviet russia you're seeing those people being told there are no more potatoes in moscow and being acutely aware of the problems they face do you think it is the same i think there's a feeling here that it it doesn't really work and that whatever way you try and find out of it it's like a strange computer game you somehow come back to the room that you left a few years ago. I mean, like, for example, at, as we talk now, you have just seen the collapse of a government that was sort of born out of the Brexit, uh, whatever you want to call it, revolt, revolution of 2015. Now, in 2022, that government tries to put forward an extreme economic project, which was just, to most people, completely mad. That yesterday fell. It's been replaced now by another Conservative government, which in response is going to bring back the very kind of policy of austerity, which you could argue is what gave you Brexit in the first place. So it's like some strange drug dream. You've, you, you've gone through Brexit, through all the contortions, through all the violence, the anger, the fury, to end up with Liz Truss, with an extreme version of capitalist's experiment. Within days it fails and you find yourself back with George Osborne and David Cameron's policies, which failed and gave you that revolt that gave you Brexit. Yet, what happened, if you notice the, the press and uh, all journalism today, is they're all celebrating this as a return to stability and a return to calm. And that's not just on the traditional right, it's also the left and the liberals are celebrating a return to calm. That's mad. And not only is it mad, it actually shows that those people don't have any idea of any alternative. They're celebrating a return to the very thing that was they saw as horrific eight years ago. I did my maths. There's, and I mean, there's an even bigger cycle there, isn't there? You could go back to 1979 and Thatcher and her Hayekian ideas that, again, were incredibly inflationary, brought about, you know, she had to U-turn. I, I, admittedly, the tool she turned to was the banks and was to debt. But it, there's, a, there's a parallel there. But what, I'm get, what I wanted to ask you about, sorry, was 
about that acknowledgement of reality because for me the belief the politics of ideology of fantasy infuses brexit right the way you're talking about it there this belief that will recapture our sovereignty will sail on the high seas that will live in the sunlit uplands of wild economic growth and then that fantasy comes into contact with reality and that reality is you know a four percent reduction in gdp it's lengthy protracted negotiations with the eu where we never really end up in control of our statute book again anyway and whether that that ideology also follows on well i think it does to trussonomics to this again what you've just outlined this radical economic project that is conjured up in textbooks and pamphlets but on contact with reality falls apart as opposed to i mean you're right that mrs thatcher did try that and you're right to say that actually her it was called a monetarist experiment back in the early 80s ran completely out of control led to the pound reaching extraordinary high levels which destroyed any attempt at having exports which really began the big deindustrialization of this country which actually you could argue is where brexit comes out of i don't think you should go too heavily on the people wanting a new sovereignty or a re- return to a dream empire what brexit was really about in i mean from my point of view i mean many people argue about it is that it was a people saying you have a two-party system which keep on imposing this one idea on us and for us it's not working we live in those deindustrialized areas and for the first time for quite a while they were given a big very big button with i'm not going to say the phrase but a very rude phrase on it and they pressed it because wouldn't you if you lived in barrow and furness and lived a horrible shitty life you, you you would press that and they pressed it and out of that came these all strange contortions which led to Johnson and his strange fantasy world, but at least he wanted to try and do something, which was what was called levelling up. What then happened, in some strange way, they turned a corner and went back to Mrs. Th- the ghost of Mrs Thatcher, without the fact that Mrs Thatcher had got a massive majority in order to do that. Yeah, mm. And so, in a way, they'd lost all contact with reality. But in response to that, we now have a... a, a a journalistic establishment, an economic establishment, and a political establishment who are welcoming a return to stability, which is actually, I'm sorry to repeat myself, the thing that gave you Brexit in the first place. So we are trapped in this sort of loop, a feedback loop, which I think is created by that fact. It's not so much they've lost contact with reality, because politics is never really about reality. What politics is about is telling you a story that makes sense of the reality you are living through it at the moment. It may be, in a way, a strange fantasy, but it it sort of makes sense of what you're living through at the moment. The stories they are telling us at the moment do not make sense of the reality. What they actually do is they make it weirder and worser. That's a bad word. (laughs) They make it weirder and worse. And that leads to a total disenchantment with politics. And to go back to Russia and the Soviet Union, Yes, they were at a very similar stage. They saw a system that everyone knew led them back in weirder and weirder ways. In the films, I try and show how, towards the end of the 80s, Gorbachev, who really did, President Gorbachev, really did believe he could save communism. And he knew it wasn't working, so he thought, OK, we'll have computers. We'll get computers in, and computers will rescue communism because it's the modern way. Uh, But I found this interview with this woman who worked for a thing called Gosplan, which was the planning organization that planned everything for everyone in the, in the state and yeah they had computers and the computers predicted to them what people would want and so the people the computers predicted that people wanted stacked heels uh, this was at the end of the 70s i mean the end of the 80s which i think is probably a bit late given that it was fashionable in the 70s i think <laughs> in britain but anyway they thought it was going to rescue them because that's what the computer said but actually by the time they'd got round to pre- telling the factories how many to produce and how to build a stacked heel, it had gone out of fashion. So whatever they tried didn't work. And it led them into this absurd world. Absolutely absurd. And I'm afraid, you, given the events of the last few days, I think we have got into an absurd world where the Liberals are now welcoming the return of the thing they used to hate. George Osborne and austerity. Austerity, is a ver- as practised in this country by people like George Osborne, was extremely one-sided and rather cruel, I think. And that's not a political statement. Is it hit the poor and the weakest of the society much worse than the rich did because of this thing called quantitative easing, which is the most boring term ever in the world. But actually what it 
was really about was pouring masses of money into the, what's called the asset class. And the asset class are those who have money and instead of investing in the stock market, started investing in assets. And they grew richer and richer and richer. And we're still there. So what I'm really saying is that, yeah, we don't have a story from any politician that actually makes sense of that reality at this moment. And we're sort of waiting for it. And I can't see where it's coming from. Mm. I mean, some of the left go, oh, it's going to be fascist populism. I don't see that. I haven't seen that. I, I don't know where it's coming from, but no one has got it at the moment. No one. Even what's he called? Martin Lewis hasn't got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right, he doesn't. But he'd probably, he'd probably be able to win an election, I mean, though, wouldn't he? He articulates the, the, the bafflement and the bewilderment yeah. of, of millions of people as the government do things that actually turn this, the financial system haywire and upside down. I mean, to be honest, I think that the, the, the work of political genius and prediction was Stranger Things, or the last episode of it. We are in the upside down world. I mean, we really have gone into it. Everything is like that. You now have the, the left-wing political class welcoming the return of George Osborne's austerity system. Well, that's the upside down world. And to people like me, just as a, a voter, I think they don't know what they're doing mm. and they know that we know that they don't know what they're doing and also the journalists know that we don't know what we're doing i mean sorry the people know that we journalists have no idea either yeah uh, there's communal ignorance yes uh, and, and communal <laughs> bewilderment yeah. is, is the better word i think i agree uh, so okay so given then there's that similarity that feedback back loop exists throughout history what lessons are available to us to learn from its previous iteration I think the really interesting thing is we're at that point. I mean, this is just, I mean, it's baffling. But my view is that we're at this point where actually the old idea of saying, oh, we can learn lessons from this, we can learn lessons from this, and we must be careful because unless we do this, this will happen. That sort of seems to be going. Uh, do you remember up until a few, well, actually very recently, there was a lot about in, in our society and in America about you mustn't do this because if you do this, something terrible will happen, like you'll get an autocracy like like Russia, that's, that's spreading. Or you're going to get radical Islamism, or if you're not careful. Or you're going to get a brutal technocracy like you have in China. Well, actually, if you, if you sort of manage to peer past the bewilderment of, of our present society and look outside, the war in Ukraine seems to be proving that the autocracy in Russia is extremely weak and fragile and may fall. The revolt in Iran, which I think is even more significant than what's happening in Ukraine, that's not to diminish Ukraine at all, but is really important, shows that that radical Islamism, which came up in 1979 at exactly the same time as Mrs. Thatcher, uh, is collapsing. And if you look at China, it's talk about a weird society. I have a friend in China who, who, whose mother lives in a hutong, one of the, the apartments, in the right in the centre of Beijing. One person went to a shop who was then found a day later to have COVID. Within two hours, 60 ambulances turned up at the Hutong, each one for one person from the Hutong to be taken off, to be kept in, like, two weeks isolation. It's mad, and it's destroying the country. And also, they have a vast debt overhang. I mean, far bigger than even the financial crash here. So w what I'm really saying is that, is that whilst we have no idea of the future, what's becoming increasingly obvious is that all those things that we were warned about like autocracy, radical Islamism, China, that if we didn't carry on doing what we're doing, that would happen. They're not turning out to be true either, which means that in a way, in a funny kind of optimism, is the way is open now. And I'm just waiting for someone to realise that the way is open. There we are. So the key phrase that the way is open and also having no idea about the future. Why do you think we are incapable of imagining, conceiving of an alternative political social system or reality? That's a very good question. No one knows. I mean, I think it's partly to do with the fact that... Uh, it's partly to do with the fact that we live in an age of what you could best describe as radical individualism. And, and where y you are encouraged, and you want it yourself, to do exactly what you feel you want to do as an individual. And you are encouraged to believe and you do believe, as I'm sure you and I do, that what I feel inside me is probably the most important thing. And the idea that you should be told what to do by a religious group, a trades union, uh, a political party, or even the BBC, is wrong. And it is sort of morally wrong. 
uh, and, and it's paternalistic and it's just wrong. The problem with that is that actually that eats away at the whole idea of mass democracy, democratic politics because the whole original idea of mass democratic politics is that you and I would be informed by journalists of bad things that are happening and to get, we would come together and we would put pressure on our lawmakers, the politicians, to do something about it. That involves actually joining together in a group and seeing a common identity and realising you're then powerful. If, you're, if you believe that actually what you think and what you feel is the most important thing and any giving yourself up to something else than that is in, in a way not, not immoral but somehow wrong, then that eats away at the idea of, of a collective power. And in those circumstances, I think people just follow their own desires. I think that was beautiful when this whole age started probably one, late 1950s, early 1960s, and people were confident and, and, and sort of went into this strange, wonderful dream world of individualism. But increasingly, and I would argue, especially since the crash in 2016, sorry, 2008, people have felt weaker and weaker because if you do live in a world in which you just follow your own desires, when things go well, it's really wonderful, it's lovely. And, and, and we have lived through, like lotus eaters, through that, possibly on a wave of borrowed money, but ignoring whether that's good or bad, it was wonderful. When things go wrong, though, it's quite scary. It's, it's like being in the woods on your own, mm. and it's frightening. You're not with your friends in the wood, because that's exciting. You're on your own in the woods. And what that does is it disempowers you. And when you feel disempowered and when you feel frightened, you cannot imagine anything else than the fear. And I'm not trying to argue that you're made to feel fearful. It's the situation you, we've all created together of this individualistic experience. When things go wrong, it eats away at our self-confidence. It eats away at, which is why I would argue that, that everyone is obsessed by trauma at the moment. I don't know if you watch, look at TikTok much, but TikTok is absolutely obsessed by personal trauma. It's all about there must be something inside you that's making you feel bad. And that is the, that's the, mod, to, to go back to, to your original question, what is stopping us imagining a better world and a better future is this idea that somehow the reason we feel bad is because there's something bad inside us. And that's so disempowering. And to be honest, whilst it may be true in a number of cases, it's also possibly true that the reason you feel bad is because you live in a shitty society. And that's not really talked about any longer. And until you start talking about that, you're not going to get that ability to imagine something new and better and wonderful, which, you know, has happened in the past, and I'm sure will happen again. But we're, we're, we've been disempowered, partly because we welcomed, we went through that gate into individualism. Individualism, you can't put it the genie back in the box, but that it does eat away at that confidence. I wholly agree with you that that, that spirit of individualism it undermines collective action. I mean, uh, a sim well, maybe not simple example, but uh, the the stop the war march, right? There's like three million people in London, and what's the slogan? Not in my name. And you're talking then about uh, wellness and you know uh, people's mental health, and I think it's one of the one of the big problems with the way we engage with uh, how we feel and whether we're happier in our lives. People don't say, oh, do you have access to good housing? Do you have access to welfare? Do you have a strong, happy home, family life? It's instead, look within yourself, put up the, put up the boundaries, cancel your toxic friendships. And actually what that ends up doing is, first of all, it doesn't engage with the structural problems that you're faced with, but it serves to seriously undermine the power of collective action if you were to try and change those structural problems. Yeah, very well put. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's completely true. And, and, and that is collective action from whether it be right or left. The, the, it, it just undermines that. And what you ha and it, I think it is the really big question of our time is, is to be brutal, was mass democracy a, a moment? Or can it be rescued and turned into something noble again? Because, or is individualism this sort of thing? I mean, one politician said to me, you just can't do it any longer. It's like squealing piglets they're just going everywhere you can't assemble so you don't actually know what is the best policy mm. this is from the politician's point of view is that if you've got a hillside full of squealing piglets going every which way what's what po what policy is going to assemble them there isn't one so what tony blair did uh, i think he was really the first one who who did this in a big way was just use focus groups 
So you go to focus groups and you ask them what what you want. That's fine if people are sort of quite confident. They can they can say I want better housing, I want this. But if they're feeling frightened, alone, and as you say, blaming themselves, then focus groups don't work any longer. So what you're faced with is a scared, isolated, lonely group of people who you don't know what policies to offer them. They can't tell you any longer because they're frightened and disempowered. So again, you get this feedback loop. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not even going to do the, the normal thing, which is what liberals do, is say, oh, if you don't do that, you'll get fascism, because I don't even think you're going to get that, because that, again, was mass politics. That involved standing in crowds and giving yourself up to something. Uh, no, individualism is this extraordinary thing that's come out of the box. You can't put it back. And the real key to any politics of the future is going to be a way of somehow allowing people still to feel they are part of something, yet also feel they are individuals who can follow their own desires. I used to think the internet could do it. I, I was sort of, I had this idea that, the, and maybe the internet could do it if it was taken away from the, these, these groups who, who have monetized it and simplified it. But I don't know. But I mean, that's the key thing, is how can you allow people to give themselves up to something, which they do want to do, mm. but yet not give away that desire to feel that you have the right to do what you want to do. And no one's managed to find a way of doing that. And that's where the politics of the future will come from. Uh, I think it's got so mad at the moment that that's going to have to come. But I can't see where it is. I, 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 I used to think it was going to be nature, but I don't think it is. Mm. The, 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 it's, it, that's too nostalgic. Um, and I don't think it's culture. That's very nostalgic as well at the moment. Have you noticed all these things that surround us that we sort of, uh, what's the word, escape into, like nature, like modern culture, it's in, they're incredibly nostalgic. Mm. Th they're not forward-looking. and so. But I still think the gate is open now. I, I do. I really do. It's promising. Um, let's, let's take it back to, uh, to the collapse of the Soviet Union then. From the embers of, uh, well, communism and then democracy, you get the, uh, the phoenix, shall we say, of Vladimir Putin rising from the ashes, um, as well as millions of traumatized Russians. Um, could, you, could you explain, first of all, how that works and sort of the route from there to now? That's a huge question, I realise. but it, No one fully understands. I mean, one of the reasons I stopped these films, effectively, uh, on New Year's Eve 1999, was that that was the moment that Putin comes to power. And I don't think we understand what Putin is. I mean, if you talk to Russian journalists... Uh, who are anti-Putin, but sensible. They say that the thing we, you in the West don't understand is that Putin did not seek power. He was chosen by a group of what called the oligarchs who had really taken power in Russia by the end of the 90s and had a drunken President Yeltsin under their thumb. They knew that his time was up and they were searching for someone who would not prosecute them, would not send them to jail or even execute them. And they found Putin as a sort of pretty basic functionary within the cage of what was known as the FSB, used to be the KGB, uh, and they made him president. And, th and what's fascinating is that here is, there are very few moments in human history where those who assume power in giant empires have not sought that power, and Putin didn't. I don't think he was a plant by the KGB, which some people have alleged. He was born out of that, I mean, what, there's a guy at the end of my films who's, a, who's called, um, what was he called, Yevgeny Kisilyov, who was a very, very famous television presenter at that time. And a BBC camera catches him just a moment in the studio, just at the end of 1999, and he turns to you and says, listen, you in the West have got to understand, communism collapsed, but also democracy has now collapsed. And in this country, if you call someone a democrat, you are cursing them. Democracy is now a curse, he says. So what you actually had at that point was a society where no one had any idea of any future. So they just accepted Putin. They didn't know what he meant or what, he, what happened. Now, a lot of Russians say, no, he's been through, he's one of these sort of shape-shifting characters, and he's been through all these shape-shifting things. I don't fully understand it, because you now have a man who seems to have embarked on some strange... What would you describe it as? sort of post-imperial nostalgia. All I know, which I think is, the, is, is interesting, is if you go back to the way the West reacted when Putin came to power, 
there was this general feeling of, oh, at last, we've got a sensible, technocratic guy. Uh, Tony Blair went to see him and said, I can deal with him. Uh, George Bush, the president, went to see him and said, I can deal with him. And there was this assumption, oh, it's all over now, that chaos is over and it'll all be fine. What I think we're seeing is a vast empire still collapsing. I mean, to go back to the analogy with the British Empire, ours took a long time to collapse. And one of the analogies I've thought, which, I mean, it's a long time ago and most people have long forgotten it, but in 1956, I think, Britain, desperate to create, keep its empire going, what it saw as its empire going, invaded Egypt because the president then had actually nationalised the Suez Canal. And the, Britons, the British thought, this is wrong, this is our route to the empire, even though the empire didn't really exist any longer. They invaded and the Americans stopped them. And it is sort of pretty similar, is that really what you're seeing is a giant empire desperately trying to hold on to a strange fantasy of, of its own. Why he's doing it, no one knows. Because when he came to power, he wasn't like that. He didn't believe in anything. He was a sort of, he was a, an empty vessel. So, so the real answer to your question is, I don't think anyone knows. I mean, it's, it's another of these areas where we just don't know. No one's explained to me Putin. And, and what, what was extremely clever about Putin is that throughout, up until before Ukraine, the Ukraine invasion, he would let the West say anything about him. Did you notice this? Uh, the, the liberals went into the, in America went into this extraordinary strange dream world of trying to say that, in fact, it was a collusion between him and Donald Trump that had given you Donald Trump without actually anyone producing any real evidence. No one's ever produced it. It was a strange, weird dream fantasy of the liberals and Putin let them do it because it gave the West and I suppose people in Russia an image of him as a man in a cave stroking a white cat and being in charge of everything. But if you talk to any Russian, any Russian journalist who knows what's going on in Moscow, they say, no, 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 look, there are so many different power groups in Moscow. What, what Putin's really trying to do is stop them all killing each other. That's, and, you know, it's a very, very fragile system. And the idea that he could actually create for you the American president, they just think is ridiculous. But, but again, we fell into it. So we go into this dream world, which sort of Putin allows us to do. And it, it's, I don't think anyone understands him. And I think that's, that's the problem of our time, of this war, is no one really gets why. I guess it's easier to tell yourself about Trump and Putin's collusion as opposed to perhaps that the electorate pressed that big button you yes. were talking about. No, I think that's true. Oh, I, yeah. think, I, think that, I think one of the most difficult things for liberals in this country and in America to face is the fact that they may have been partly responsible for Brexit and for Trump because they allowed a very corroding and possibly corrupt system to persist because they were doing quite well out of it. They weren't corrupt themselves, but they were the beneficiaries of what was effectively an increasingly corrupted system. The thing I was talking about earlier on, quantitative easing, it's a completely banal, benign phrase, seemingly benign phrase, but actually you could argue that it was as big a looting of the system as what the oligarchs did in Russia. It would never be categorised as that, and you could never accuse the people involved of being criminals, but it was a it sure a vast shift of wealth away from a, the majority of people towards a small minority, uh, which I think sort of partly helped give you Brexit. Mm. Yeah, I guess in the same way, the, the, the first couple of oligarchs, the way they enriched themselves... Um, wasn't actually necessarily illegal. It was understanding, you know, quirks in the system yes. and how to speculate non-cash into real cash. Yeah. And this is actually one of the things I wanted to try and explain gently in, in these films, is that they weren't these sort of super criminals. I mean, some of them did some criminal things, but that was later. Early on, they were very intelligent, clever children of the Soviet system, of the establishment, who spotted that as this system was collapsing, it was becoming not only absurd, but the, a strange logic was coming into play, which meant that you could actually siphon some money out of it, from out of nothing. And they just thought, oh, this is clever. Well, there is an argument that, that in this country, as the economic system became weirder and weirder, especially after the crash of 2008, Sort of clever people here worked out how to do that as well. It wasn't illegal at all. But what you saw is the vast transfer of wealth into the hands of a small minority. That's, and that's why all around us in London you see these extraordinary apartment blocks going up. Just the amount of wealth in London, yet there is extreme poverty. And you don't have to adopt any political position in order to notice that. 
because no one has really explained to go back to the original question, no one's actually come up with a, a story that explains why all this is happening. No politician has done it, right or left. And that's, they're all floundering around. And that's where we are. I wonder if uh, Gordon Brown ever sat in his office, Yeltsin-like, with his bodyguard looking at a wall saying that they're stealing England. Um, let's, let's, so let's go back then to, um, so communism collapses, democracy collapses, and then you end up in this sort of uh, autocratic-ish Putin brainchild society, which perhaps you would describe as dystopian. Do you think, well, maybe not then, but do you think, well, do you think dystopia is perhaps more appealing or easier to accept or understand by people that live within these systems than imagining a utopia that they could progress towards? Well, I, I think there are two things for that. One is that if you are on your own in a system, that, no, what Putin did early on was that he flooded uh, Russia with money because the oil price went up massively and he benefited from that. But to answer your question about dystopias, why it is one of the very interesting questions of our time, is why is everything dystopian at the moment in our culture and why do we sort of fetishise it? Are we actually trying to make ourselves feel better somehow? I mean, I, I made a short film for Charlie Brooker once where I did it. I did it in a silly way, but I do think it's sort of the thing of our time, is that if you don't believe in anything any longer, which I sort of think the class that I come out of possibly doesn't any longer. It's a terrible, terrible, dirty, dark secret is that maybe we really don't believe in anything any longer. We're frightened of everything happening. We're frightened of what might come, happen to the planet. We're, we're frightened of what, what might happen to this economic system. Our only response is what I called odierism, is that you, 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 you look at the newspaper in the morning and you see terrible things happening and your only response is oh dear and i think that's sad and i'm, I'm still not quite sure what, what's happened i mean i think the climate change movement is a very interesting example is that you are facing a really serious problem but instead of actually linking it to the feelings of people who are weak and disempowered at the moment and saying look together we could solve this and not only solve the problems of the planet but also actually make a better world now what has captured the climate change movement is a sort of technocratic view which is no we just we all we got to do is make sure the system clicks back to stability which I would argue is exactly the same as your, what you're hearing today from the newspapers saying, Phew, at last Liz Truss has gone, now we can go back to stability, ignoring the fact that it's going to carry on a, a, a system of, of growing inequality. And, and that's the argument you would say about the climate change movement, is that no, none of the people who captured the climate change movement from about, what, 1992 onwards, ever really confronted the fact that it, maybe it was the actual kind of society you have that is creating the climate change problem. And that therefore, you're actually, if you're going to have to change the, d deal with the climate change problem, you're going to have to change the society. They would not confront this. What they kept on saying was, no, 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 we just have to reset the system back to, I mean, they used to argue about how many degrees. Do you remember all that? And it's only until very, very, very recently with things like the school strike movement that you actually began to get people saying, no, we've got to change society. We've got to. And of course, the next step, if you're a good what's the word, uh, optimistic politician, is to say, well, no, actually, we could actually save the planet and we could build a better society. And you might take people with you then. But that's not happening. Have you noticed this? I have. Yeah. The climate change movement actually keeps on trying to tell you you're going to die. And whilst, of course, you're facing a really serious danger, I would argue that's not really the way you're going to actually succeed in taking people with you. Mm and building a better world. And actually, the clever thing to do would be to say, look, as well as actually saving the planet, we can actually deal with the very issues that make you angry, alone, unhappy and bewildered now by, I don't know, re-industrialising in a completely powerful way or something like this, making something really exciting. If you combine the, the impotence of that odierism with, uh, well, maybe it maybe not combines it, but it undermines the alleged... Uh, the alleged sort of ultimate freedom that we've we've secured via ind individualism it, it, it kind of uh is the counterweight to that it's that you instead of actually doing anything about the problems you face you just sit there and go yeah oh dear and and i do think this is i don't know i think some clever person is going to have to find a way to say to the powerful mid-range elites in our society look 
you are a, you're being a bit what's the polite word you you are partly responsible for the failure of these things and if you and, and i know you don't like what's happening but you've got to do something about it i mean i i did notice the thing that really shocked me after brexit and also trump in america is that the people who hated brexit and the people who hated trump did absolutely nothing to go and talk to the people who voted for brexit and voted for trump and say to them yes actually i see why you did it but you were conned by the people who led brexit and you were conned by the people around trump and you're being used but actually i see why you did it very, very, very few people did that. Instead, they retreated, as you were saying, into fantasies about how really it was Putin that gave you... Well, in fact, actually, they, they had fantasies that it was Putin that gave you um, Brexit, as far as I remember. Uh, no one went out and said to these that the people who voted, they said, no, I, I do understand why you did it. I mean, of course, there are strange, really weird retired colonels in Surrey and nasty racists down in, I don't know, the Dartford marshes who probably did vote lurking exactly but but I do think there was a substantial majority who did it because they were offered for the first time for a long time a way of expressing their anger and revolt against a system that made them feel disempowered frightened weak and poor do you think that's do you think that's what's been lost in all of this the people that yeah. inhabit the capitalist it doesn't matter capitalist communist whatever system it is they inhabit yeah, it's a it's a sense it's a sense of empathy for for what other people are, are are going through, and politics has lost that. Whether you can argue that possibly that comes from individualism, and that it's an individualism that has gone sour and become corrupted, and can be recaptured, but there is a sense of a lack of sympathy and understanding for other people in a, in our political system at the moment. I don't quite understand why. Adam, that could be construed as construed as quite a. Um upsetting miserable place to leave it but there's no need for us to be overly pessimistic about the future is there no i'm not um, in a funny way even though we are living in this strange time of chaos and uncertainty and no one quite knows what's going to happen tomorrow i've got this funny optimism sitting in me because it's almost like if you take liz trust she's crashed the car we've survived we're now opening the door and we're walking out but all those things that used to be in a way a block against trying to say oh no we could try it a different way autocracy in russia is collapsing radical islamism in iran is collapsing that sort of super hyper technocracy where you were going to live in a surveillance state that china represent that also seems to be collapsing with their vast debt problem that isn't that there aren't those blocks that say oh no no you can't you can't go that way you can't because that'll happen or that'll happen so in a way the way is now open and what i'm waiting for is for someone to realize that because i suspect that all people want is to be able to say, no, okay, none of this seems to work. What could work? What could inspire us? And all you need is someone to actually take that and run with it. And I think maybe we have got past peak dystopia. I, I really do think that. It's almost like th that at that very moment, everything seems to be crumbling. Maybe something might, some light might come through in the cracks. I, I, I just sort of instinctively feel that. Or find the aspiration and optimism in the systems we already have, or slim parts of it anyway. Um, Adam Curtis, thank you so much for taking the time to Pleasure. speak to us. Thanks for inviting me. Trauma Zone is uh, on iPlayer now.